Okay, so in the previous two lectures, we've been studying the Nyquist plots, uh, which as we know at this point are essentially just representations of the frequency response function, uh, only we visualize it in the s-plane. And at this point, we've, uh, we've discussed two methods for how to sketch the Nyquist plot. Uh, the first method involves uh, basically uh, the, the first method involves uh, direct translation or, or um, transfer of the data from the Bode plot directly onto the S plane. Um, so in, o in order to use method one, you actually need to have a fairly accurate Bode plot uh, in order to sketch the Nyquist plot. The, uh, the second method that we uh, discuss does not involve uh, the Bode plot. You don't need to have an, a Bode plot in order to sketch the Nyquist plot, and we take a more analytical approach. Um, but in order to use method two, we actually need to ensure that the uh, frequency response is monotonic. So it's either monotonically increasing or decreasing on both the magnitude and phase. Um, if, though, if that criteria is satisfied, we can uh, be confident that method two will generate an accurate Nyquist plot as well. Um, however, the entire point of sketching the Nyquist plot is ultimately to be able to apply the Nyquist stability criterion so that we can actually do some control design. Um, and the Nyquist stability criterion is, is here. Right? So z equals p minus n. Uh, this is it. This is fundamentally the last design tool that we're going to be using to do control design. Um, and this is another design tool that, that guarantees uh, closed loop stability, uh, but we take it, we, we approach it in the frequency domain rather than in the time domain. Um, so re recall, we, we did a little bit of this in the last lecture. So if you missed lecture 14, I encourage you to revisit that, uh, where we looked at an example or two of how to apply the Nyquist stabili uh, stability criterion. Uh, the, the main idea though is, well, Z is number of closed loop poles. so we we basically want this equal to zero. If z is equal to zero, we have no unstable closed loop poles, therefore we can uh, conclude that we have uh, closed loop stability. Uh, th this p here is the number of um, unstable open loop poles, which we're going to get from the open loop transfer function L of s, which by the way for uh, for the Nyquist plots is always equal to c times p if we are considering a uh, control architecture uh, of the unity feedback uh, variety. Okay, so L of S is equal to C times P. Uh, look at the open loop poles of that. However many of those are unstable, that's equal to P uh, in the Nyquist stability criterion. And then of course N, this is the whole reason we need the Nyquist plot. So we get this parameter N from the Nyquist plot. And again, it's the number of counterclockwise encirclements about the point negative uh, one uh, on the Nyquist plot. Um, and what we found is for systems that contain a control parameter like K, we can to some extent influence N. We can influence the number of encirclements in the Nyquist plot. And if we can influence N, then we can somewhat influence Z and hence uh, influence the closed loop stability of the system. Okay, so what we have here is a sort of an introductory example. We'll go through this example, and we'll basically figure out all the values of k, if there are any, um, such that we can guarantee closed loop stability for the unity feedback structure with a simple uh, proportional controller and this unstable plant. Okay, so so if we uh, if we jump right into this, what we need first of all is to sketch the Nyquist plot. Uh, of L of S so that we can get that N value. Uh, but to start, we can actually see right away that for this problem, P is equal to 1. We have one unstable pole in the open loop transfer function. It, it occurs at positive 2. So this is sort of the one freebie that you get at the start of the problem is the number of unstable open loop poles. Okay, so what we're seeing here just just with this basic information, what we're going to see is we're going to need the number of encirclements in the Nyquist plot uh, in a counterclockwise fashion to be equal to one in order to guarantee zero closed loop poles, uh, closed loop unstable poles. Okay, so let's just uh, go forward with this problem and see what the Nyquist plot's going to look like. 
uh, we're going to get our L of S, which is C times P, which in this case is just K times S plus 1 over S minus 2. And in order to sketch the Nyquist plot, remember the Nyquist plot is a plot of L of J omega. So we need to get the frequency response function L of J omega, which means we're plugging in J omega everywhere we see S, and we get a transfer function that looks like this. I'm sorry, this is actually no longer a transfer function, it's a frequency response function. From here, and I'm going through this kind of quickly because there's uh, several examples of how to apply method 2 in lecture 14. Um, essentially, for every complex value we see, we want to replace that with uh, an expression in uh, exponential form. So we have r1 e to the j theta 1. In the denominator, we have another one, r2 e to the j theta 2. And then, of course, we want to write this in a more compact form. So we're going to uh, factor out all the magnitudes, which gives us kr1 over r2, e to the j uh, theta 1 stays positive, but we want to bring this uh, exponent into the numerator, so we have to change the sign for theta 2. And we're going to let this sort of sit for the moment, because what we have done here is we've developed an expression for the overall magnitude function and the overall phase function, which is going to come in handy in just a little bit. So moving along, what we want to do next is to start doing our mapping. Okay, so we it's essentially the Nyquist plot is um, we're applying contour mapping to generate the Nyquist plot. And what that means is we're going to start with our A contour, which is a plot of all of our poles and zeros. So we've got, let's see, we've got a, a, a stable zero at negative one, but we have that unstable pole at positive two. Okay, so just looking back at our original uh, open loop transfer function L of S here, uh, Stable 0 at negative 1, unstable pole at positive 2. That's reflected on this A contour here. What we do from here is to draw rays from those points to a common point on the imaginary axis. And we need to label these, again, according to how we define them in this step here. So we call the pole, sorry, we call the 0 at negative 1, R1 theta 1. So this should remain R1, this should remain theta 1, and the unstable pole, that's R2, theta 2. And remember, angles are always measured from a positive real axis. Okay, so we've got our A contour here. Next step is to tabulate, right? So along with the A contour, there's always going to be a table that depicts what happens as we increase the frequency from 0 plus, which is essentially what happens when this point is slid all the way down close to the origin, and then we're going to just slide that point up to infinity and see what happens along the way. For this problem, there are four parameters that we need to keep track of, r1, r2, theta1, and theta2. When this point is close to 0 plus, right, so omega is 0 plus, that means we're very close to the origin, r1 is equal to 1, r2 is equal to about 2. At that same point, theta 1 is close to 0 degrees, sort of on this horizontal, but theta 2 is about 180 degrees. Remember, we're measuring theta 2 from a positive real. As we slide this point all the way up to infinity, that represents sort of the frequency response as omega goes along the uh, frequency axis from 0 up to infinity. So as omega approaches infinity, both of these uh, R's, the, the, the magnitudes, both, both approach infinity, and both of those angles approach 90 degrees. At this point, now it's time to revisit our uh, L of J omega function that we wrote uh, in exponential form. What we get to do now is to use what we have for the magnitude and phase function. So the magnitude function itself is K times R1 over R2, which when omega is close to 0, we have k times 1 divided by 2, so we have k over 2. As we increase to infinity, we essentially have k times infinity over infinity, right? k times r1 over r2. 
Generally, when we see infinity over infinity, we're dealing with a mathematically indeterminate form. And generally, we have to apply L'Hopital's rule to get some sense of what that converges to. However, in this very special case, remember that these infinities here, these represent distances from a common axis, this horizontal real axis, to a common point on the imaginary axis. So you can imagine if R1 approaches 100 billion, then R2 essentially approaches the same value, uh, except for this slight offset in the real component. So essentially what I'm saying is for, for the Nyquist plots, infinities cancel, which is the only time I will ever say that. Okay, So R, R1 over t R2, those will cancel, and we're just left with K. Okay, So for the phases, we have that the phase function is theta 1 minus theta 2. 0 minus 180 gives us negative 180. 90 minus 90 gives us 0. The direction associated with negative 180, which is here, to 0 is I need to go from this point at negative 180. I need to increase through negative 90, keep increasing until I get to 0. In other words, I need to add degrees to get from minus 180 to 0, which indicates counterclockwise rotation. Okay. All right, so with these bottom two rows complete, I can actually now sketch the Nyquist plot associated with this problem. And we can continue with the control design portion. Okay, so with these two points, uh, with these bottom two rows here, what we have, and this is going to be our B contour, our Nyquist plot. Remember, so this is not the same, this is not the same uh, S plane as we were dealing with in the A contour. A contour is where we deal with all of our poles and zeros. The B contour S plane is where we actually plot the Nyquist mapping. Okay. When omega is close to zero, we have a magnitude of k over two at a phase angle of minus 180. So we're actually going to be starting at negative 180, so the negative real axis, at a magnitude of k over two. So this actual intersection point on the real axis is minus k over two. Now you can see here from the phase plot, uh, for the phase function, that we're going to sweep through an angle of minus 180, increase all the way to an angle of zero, like this. So the phase angle is going to sweep through that range of, of angles, while at the same time the magnitude is increasing from k over 2 to twice that. Uh, it's going to increase to k. Okay? So through this angular sweep, our starting point is here at k over 2. Our ending point should be over here at k. And what ends up happening is through this phase sweep, our magnitude is simply increasing as we make that sweep through those angles, like so. Okay, so this is the first half of our Nyquist plot. Remember, we always need to in indicate where the frequency is 0 plus and positive infinity. We also need to indicate, indicate the direction of increasing omega. And of course, the bottom two rows of this table only give us the first half of the Nyquist plot. We also need to consider all the negative frequencies, which we can get by mirroring the Nyquist plot about the origin. Uh, I'm sorry, about the real axis, which gives us uh, minus infinities here, increasing up to 0 minus. And this gives us a complete Nyquist plot for the problem at hand. Okay, so for this L of S, uh, for this L of J omega, the Nyquist plot is here. Okay, so now if you recall, for Nyquist stability criterion, we have that P is equal to 1. There's nothing we can do about that. We want Z to be 0. Okay, so, so we want there to be 0 closed loop poles. Uh, and if we want this equation to hold true, what that means is that we want n to equal 1 in the Nyquist plot. So we want the Nyquist plot to encircle the value negative 1 uh, in, a, in a counterclockwise fashion one time. Right? So in other words, we look at this picture, and any time we have k in the open loop transfer function, we're going to have the ability to expand or contract the Nyquist plot about the origin.
right? Imagine if k were equal to 1, then this point here would be 1, and this point over here would be minus 1 half. On the flip side, if we increase k to 10, this circle expands out, and this intersection over here becomes 10, this intersection over here becomes negative 10 over 2, or negative 5, okay? So if we want n to equal negative 1, what that means is we want to see this counterclockwise Nyquist plot encircle the value negative 1, right? <clears throat> if this were the picture here, where negative 1 is inside of the circle, then n would be equal to 1. We'd have one counterclockwise, counterclockwise encirclement. However, if we find that k is such that this Nyquist plot is really small, and the value negative 1 falls outside of that circle, n is equal to 0. Okay, so you can see in this problem we have the choice. We can basically adjust n between the values of 0 and 1 by choosing our k values accordingly. Uh, furthermore, we can see that this specific intersection point is minus k over 2. So in order to guarantee that n equals 1, what it means is that k ought to be greater than 2. Okay, let's pause on that for a moment and just see how that's the case, right? If k is greater than 2, let's just say k is uh, equal to 3, then this intersection point here, which generally speaking is minus k over 2, becomes minus 3 over 2. So minus 3 halves, which is greater, sorry, which uh, is, is less than negative 1, which puts negative 1 inside of this uh, circle. Okay, so if k is greater than 2, we get that n equals 1. So any value of k larger than 2 is going to put negative 1 inside of this Nyquist plot, which means that n is equal to 1. And if n is equal to 1, then z is equal to 0, which guarantees closed-loop stability. So the logic here is, as long as k is greater than 2, we are going to produce one counterclockwise encirclement about negative 1 in the Nyquist plot. And if that's the case, then our, the number of closed-loop unstable poles will be 0 because we have p is equal to 1 unstable open-loop pole. Subtract from that the 1 in counterclockwise encirclement and we'll get um, 0 unstable closed-loop poles. Okay? So this is uh, sort of just a refresher example of how to apply Nyquist stability criterion. Um, and it all, it all hinges on this idea that the Nyquist plot itself will expand or contract about the origin if there's a k or some type of control gain in the open loop transfer function. And that expansion and contraction is what allows us to adjust this n to some degree. And in some cases, it will allow us to find a range of k that will produce zero closed loop unstable poles. In other words, guarantee closed loop stability. Okay, so now that we're warmed up a little bit, um, we can look at an example, sort of a modification of something that we looked at in lecture 14. So similar to lecture 14, but not exact, let's look at this transfer function. Okay, so this transfer function now includes uh, a control parameter k. And, and what we've got here is we're trying to apply Nyquist stability criterion to figure out all the values of k that will guarantee closed loop stability. Um, using method two, we were able to generate a Nyquist plot that looks something, something like this. It has the same general shape, only now we're including this gain parameter. So things will change a little bit. However, the Nyquist plot ends up looking like a sort of spiral shape and this is this part comes from lecture 14 where we essentially uh, we essentially did this example okay so we have through our entire method 2 process we found that this point was 0 plus and this point over here was positive infinity okay in this case over here this intersection point is k over 2 and of course to get the other half uh, we need to mirror this about the real axis. Okay, so our Nyquist plot ends up looking like this. There's minus infinity, and here is zero minus here. Okay. Now this is an interesting problem, and it's going to highlight the next sort of 
analytical challenge that that comes up as we try to do these Nyquist stability um, problems analytically. Okay, so what you see here is by method two, essentially we always get the endpoints. We get the point for which omega is equal to zero plus, and we get the point for which omega is equal to or approaching positive infinity, and that's about it. We don't get any specific intermediate points, right? Now, in order to apply Nyquist stability criterion for this problem, we're going to see that, right, as always, z is equal to p minus n. P in this case equals 2. We've got two unstable open loop poles, right? However, we want, we always want z to be equal to 0, so in this problem, we actually want n to be equal to 2. We want the Nyquist plot itself to encircle the point negative 1 in a counterclockwise fashion two times, and if we can achieve that, then we can guarantee closed loop stability. What this means for this picture over here is that, well, our method two uh, for sketching the Nyquist plot gives us these two endpoints, the zero plus and positive infinity, and like I said, pretty much no additional information specific to any particular frequencies. And what we need for this problem is essentially to figure out where is this point? Where is this intersection point here? Um, because if we can figure that out in terms of the gain parameter k, then we can figure out for what values of k will negative 1 fall inside of this sort of inner loop. And if negative 1 does fall somewhere in this inner loop, we can see that we've got two encirclements about negative 1. Okay, so that would guarantee us closed loop stability. So that's kind of the setup for this problem. The, the rest of this problem is uh, essentially devoted to how do we find that, re uh, that real axis crossing uh, to figure out point A. Okay. Um, well, the way we're going to approach that is is to start with the understanding that the Nyquist plot itself, okay, so the Nyquist plot itself, this weird squiggly contour in the S-plane, this is in fact a plot of L of j omega. It is a visualization of the frequency response function as, as depicted in the S-plane. So you are looking at right this sort of double loop picture, that is L of j omega. Um, and the reason I'm emphasizing that so much is that when we looked at the root locus plot, uh, there was a situation in the root locus concept. Now remember, I'm going back to root locus, which is totally different. But there was this concept in the root locus where we had these root locus branches kind of going all over the place in the S-plane. And if we wanted to find, say, the intersection of the root locus branch and the imaginary axis, right, we wanted to find the critical value of k that puts us right on the imaginary axis, the way to solve that problem was to set the uh, imaginary part of L of j omega set that equal to zero and solve for omega critical, right? And omega critical, of course, was that distance up the imaginary axis to that intersection point. And then from there, you can back uh, substitute and compute k critical. This started with setting the imaginary part of L of j omega to zero and solving uh, for various uh, uh, parameters along the way. This was a little bit counterintuitive because remember you're trying to find an imaginary axis intersection by setting the imaginary part of L of j omega equal to zero. That was a bit strange because it seems at first glance if you want to find the imaginary axis crossing that you would set the real part equal to zero. The reason that was not the case for the root locus plot The reason that was not the case in the root locus be, is because the root locus itself, these branches, those are not a plot of L of j omega. Okay, so these are not, this is not a plot of L of j omega. It's a plot of closed loop poles as a function of increasing k. And the way to find this critical value of k mathematically was to take sort of this mathematical path through the frequency response function. So we were able to use this math 
to find the critical k value for the root locus. And sort of counterintuitively, it meant that we have to set the imaginary part of L of j omega equal to zero to find the imaginary axis crossing for the closed loop pulse. Okay, this was the one that was this was the part that was a bit counterintuitive. The only reason I'm bringing this up now is because we're at another point where we're looking at essentially strange contours or lines in the S plane, and now we are trying to find the real axis crossing. Okay, so the mathematical approach to finding this real axis crossing for the Nyquist plot is actually identical to finding the imaginary axis crossing in the root locus. In other words, to find point A on the Nyquist plot, we need to set the imaginary part of L of j omega equal to zero. We need to, we need to do that math, and by, by doing that, we're going to find the critical value of omega that uh, puts us right on that sort of real axis crossing, and then we're going to back substitute into L of j omega of a to find that exact intersection point a. Okay. Again, the only reason I'm bringing this up now is to highlight a very um, typical point of confusion. Right. So the mathematics for finding the real axis crossing on the Nyquist plot is exactly the same as finding the imaginary axis crossing on the root locus plot. Now, to find point A on the Nyquist plot, this one is actually more intuitive because, again, it all boils down to the fact that the Nyquist plot itself is a plot of L of j omega, and so setting the imaginary part of L of j omega equal to zero naturally is where you're going to cross the real axis. Okay? The, the one that's confusing or counterintuitive is the root locus plot. I just want you to keep that in mind as we move forward because there are going to be several scenarios where you need to compute L of j omega and set either the real or imaginary part equal to zero. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm only bringing this up to sort of get ahead of that confusion and hopefully this will clear some of that up. Nonetheless, we are still on our path to find this uh, real axis crossing for this particular Nyquist plot over here. So yes, indeed, we need to set the imaginary part of L of j omega equal to zero to find that frequency where we cross the uh, imaginary, uh, I'm sorry, where we cross the real axis. Okay. In order to do that, we of course need to go back and figure out what our frequency response function is. Now this part admittedly is a bit tedious. This always kind of takes a little bit of time. Um, and what we're doing is we're just replacing s with j omega in our original transfer function. Okay, so I've just replaced s with j omega, and now we have ourselves the complex valued frequency response function. And so we want to eventually write this as real plus imaginary so that ultimately we can take the imaginary part and set it equal to zero. One of the strategies that's relatively straightforward, albeit a bit tedious, is to conjugate the denominator so that we guarantee a real value denominator and then separate the numerator into real and imaginary components. So what that looks like is the following. I prefer to write complex numbers in a more uh, a traditional form. So real plus imaginary. 1 plus omega j is the same as j omega plus 1. And I'll do that for all of these complex values just because it makes, makes it a little bit easier to visualize, I think. So there's a complex number, there's a complex number, like so. What we need to do is to conjugate both of these so that we get real values. So the complex conjugate of minus 1 plus omega j is minus 1 minus omega j. Multiply top and bottom so that we're not changing the problem. And the same goes for the other complex number. Like so. Okay. Now, uh, to multiply out this entire denominator is actually relatively straightforward. We're just going to take advantage of one of the properties of uh, complex conjugates, which is that alpha plus j beta times alpha minus j beta, right? So if you multiply complex conj conjugates together, the whole idea is that the cross terms are always going to cancel out. So you can go straight from this to simply saying, oh, this is going to equal alpha squared plus 
beta squared, and it's going to be real valued. That's just a guarantee. It's a it's a uh, a property of complex conjugates. Okay, so for the denominator, it's very straightforward. We just have okay, we've got omega squared plus one squared, which is one, times omega squared plus two squared, which is four. Okay, so that's the entire denominator, and we didn't have to do anything else but apply this property of complex numbers. The real trick to this problem is basically realizing that there's no trick to expanding out the numerator, right? So the numerator, which is k times this, times this, times this, that needs to be fully expanded. And then once it's fully expanded, you can collect all of the real stuff and separate it from all of the imaginary stuff. That's really the only part of this problem that really takes a bit of time, which which can be a bit tedious, but, you know, it's really not... It's not that bad. You just got to, you know, uh, you know, take it one step at a time. Let's, we'll foil these guys and sort of expand these and then distribute this stuff into whatever we get there. Okay, so the, the ultimate expansion takes a little bit of time. Um, and I'm not going to do all of it here just because it really is just tedious. Um, I'll write down my final answer so that you can com uh, compare what you get and make sure you're getting the same thing. Uh, but what I get is the real stuff in the numerator is k times 2 minus 4 omega squared. And then all the rest of this stuff, which is uh, k times omega minus omega squared plus 5 over the same denominator, because we're just separating the real and imaginary components, all of this is the imaginary component. Okay, so I, I skipped, essentially I expanded this numerator separated it into real and imaginary components, and that gave me L of j omega written as the sum of a real component and an imaginary component. Okay, This is a process that you see over and over again with both the root locus analysis as well as the Nyquist stability criterion. So, uh, you know, I encourage you to, to look it over, kind of just fight through it until you get to a point where it's maybe tedious, but it's it's straightforward. Okay. Once we have once we have L of j omega written as real plus imaginary, now we're just going back to this argument here, which says, well, in order to find the real axis intersection point A, we'd have to take the imaginary component and set it equal to zero. Okay, so taking this, setting it equal to zero, imaginary component of L of j omega equals zero, that gives us, basically, we're going to solve for all the values of omega that make that equation true, okay? So what you can see here is that omega equals zero will, will surely make the imaginary component uh, zero, as well as uh, plus and minus root five, as well as, if you notice, the order of the denominator is four and the order of the numerator is three, so if, if we allow omega to approach uh, infinity, plus or minus, we will actually make the imaginary component equal to zero as well. Um, and just for just for comparison, I'm going to say zero minus and zero plus, just to stay consistent with our notation. So zero minus or zero plus plugged into the imaginary component will make the entire imaginary component equal to zero. The only reason I did it this way is to is to highlight that essentially six values of omega will ensure that the imaginary component of L of j omega is zero. And what that means is according to our Nyquist plot, six values of omega, there should be six intersection points of the Nyquist plot uh, with the real axis. And so we can verify that that's the case because we see that from the first part of our Nyquist plot, if we plug in either 0 plus or 0 minus, we are intersecting the real axis. If we plug in either positive or negative infinity, we're intersecting the real axis. And as it turns out, the only one that we didn't know was this plus or minus root 5. And so that just means that this intersection point here must represent a value of omega equals plus root 5 or negative root 5. Okay. So, so everything here is consistent with our uh, our Nyquist plot. Furthermore, plus or minus root 5, this is the value that we want to choose as our sort of 
what we're going to call omega sub a, the, the frequency at which we are crossing the real axis at point a. Okay, All we have to do now is back substitute that frequency, either plus root 5 or minus root 5, back into L of j omega to find that critical point. Okay, Now, let's be... Um, Let's be intelligent about how we do this, because if we plug root 5 back into the imaginary component, we're going to get 0 by definition, right? Because that's how we came up with root 5 in the first place, is we set the imaginary component to 0. So, all of this to say, in order to find the point, the, the intersection point A, we need to simply plug root 5 back into the real component of L of j omega. So we can say it's the real component of L of j times omega a. And we just need to compute this. So, so in this case, the real, the real component of L of j omega is k times 2 minus 4. And let's just pick root 5, positive root 5, because it's the same as negative root 5. And we're just really just, uh, we're just plugging in root 5 everywhere we see omega in this computation. like so. And at the end of the day, what we end up with is that the point A is equal to negative k over 3. Negative k over 3. Okay, so back up on our, uh, back up on our Nyquist plot, we now know, right, so this is no longer a question, this intersection point right here, we'll call it point A, is equal to minus k over 3. And that's the last piece of the puzzle that we need because this is still our Nyquist stability criterion, right? We want z to be equal to 0. p is always equal to 2. There's nothing we can do about that. n, this is uh, sort of up to us. Based on our choice of k, n can either be 0 or it can be 2. And what we see from this problem is that n will be 2 as long as k itself is greater than 3. Okay. k being greater than 3 puts this intersection point to the left of negative 1 and therefore guarantees two counterclockwise encirclements about negative 1. Okay, so all of this to say, all of this to say, if k is greater than 3, right, the logic goes like this, then n is equal to 2. And if n is equal to 2, then z minus uh, z equals p minus n becomes 0 equals 2 minus 2, and therefore we guarantee closed loop stability. Okay, so this is a controlled design process using the Nyquist stability criterion. Okay, so with that example under our belt, we can go ahead and jump into one last example. Okay, this example was designed to include all of the strange kind of nuances that we've seen along the way. And so this will serve as a very good benchmark example for you to understand as we move into the uh, sort of final exam zone. Okay, so if you understand this problem all the way through from start to finish, um, I would say that you're in good shape um, as, as far as understanding the concepts of Nyquist um, stability criterion. Okay, so, so the problem setup is like so. We're trying to, again, we're using uh, the Nyquist stability criterion to design a controller that will guarantee closed loop stability. And again, because we're using the Nyquist stability criterion, we are essentially doing frequency domain uh, control design. Okay, so for this example, we're going to use an integral controller. Okay, so K over S. The idea here, the, probably the motivation here, is that, well, we want to improve our steady state performance, perhaps we want to bump up the system type so that we can track um, more references uh, more accurately. Uh, our plant is a simple first order unstable uh, transfer function. So S plus 1 over S minus 5. Okay, What that means is that our L of S, our open loop transfer function, which is C times P, is k times s plus 1 over s times s minus 5. Okay, so this is our open loop transfer function. Ultimately, we're going to be using Nyquist stability criterion to do this control design. 
uh, right away what we can see is that, well, we've got a pole at the origin, right? We have, we have a pole at the origin. So the number of unstable open loop poles for this problem, well, it's either one or two, right? Because this pole here at positive five, that's always unstable. The only question is, well, is a pole at the origin stable or unstable? Okay, so that's the question that remains. We're, we're going to leave that question for now. We're going to make an assumption about it later on in the problem. Uh, there's a lot we can do first before we get to that point, so let's just knock that stuff out first. We want to get the general shape of the Nyquist plot first, and using method 2 is a good way to get to that point. Okay, so just like all the previous examples, we want the frequency response function, so we're going to plug in j omega everywhere we see s. And we also want to express this whole thing in exponential form so that we can derive our magnitude and phase functions analytically. Okay, the way we do that is, again, everywhere we see a complex value, replace it with an exponential counterpart, like so. Once we do this, we can actually go ahead and sort of make this more compact. So factor out all of the magnitudes, kr1 over r2, r3, e to the j. Now we've got theta1 in the numerator. We want to move theta2 and theta3 into the numerator, so we'll change the sign, like so. What this has done for us is to give us the frequency response function written in exponential form. And this is going to come in handy in just a little bit because we've got our magnitude function and our phase function derived in an analytical form. Okay, so this is all the same uh, as, as the previous examples. What we generally do at this point is to sketch what we call our A contour, which is just to map all the poles and zeros of our original L of S here. Okay, so we've got pole at a uh, pole at uh, positive 5, right? This unstable pole at positive 5, also a pole at the origin. Right? We know that's going to give us some trouble later on, but you know we're going to deal with that later. And then we have our 0 at ne uh, negative 1. Okay, so there's negative 1 there. From this point, we're going to draw rays to an arbitrary point up the imaginary axis, like so. And then we're going to label those according to how we define our exponential uh, functions. Okay, so the stable zero at negative one, we called that R1, theta one. The pole at the origin, that's called R2, theta two. <clears throat> and then the unstable pole at positive five was R3, theta three. Of course, remembering that our Angles are always me always measured from a positive real. With our A contour finished, we go to our table, which, remember, tabulates uh, everything that's going on with all of these six parameters in this case. So we've got to keep track of R1, R2, R3, as well as theta1, theta2, and theta3. When this point is slid down very close to the origin, we can see that R1 is 1, R2 is 0, and R3 is 5. At that same point, when this point is really, really close to the origin, theta 1 is pretty much horizontal, so 0 degrees. Theta 2 is vertical, 90 degrees, and theta 3 is 180 degrees. Then, as we slide this point up, to infinity to see what happens as omega approaches positive infinity. Well, all of the uh, the length of all of those rays approach infinity, and all of the angles measured from a positive real approach 90. Right? I mean, those rays are essentially all approaching infinite length vertical lines. Okay, at this point. We are, com we are done with uh, tabulating all of the rays, so we actually get to sketch our, uh, our uh, we get to populate the bottom two rows. Uh, 
which is where we get to use our magnitude and phase functions that we derived previously. So the magnitude function, that's k, r1 over r2, r3. When omega is close to 0, we're looking at this first column, so it's k times 1 over 0 times 5. So that's basically infinity. And then if we plug in infinity, we get k times infinity over infinity squared. Remember, this is the only case where we can cancel infinities, and our magnitude approaches 0. For the phase, we're just applying this function, theta 1 minus theta 2 minus theta 3. And so we have minus 270 for the omega equals 0 plus column. And we have minus 90 for the column where omega approaches infinity. It's always really important to get the direction of rotation right. Okay, so minus 270, if you imagine where that is, here's 0. Here's minus 90, here's minus 180, here's minus 270. We're starting on the positive imaginary axis. To get to negative 90, which is here on the negative imaginary axis, we need to add degrees, okay, so minus 270 up through minus 180, continuing on to minus 90. That gives us counterclockwise rotation. And of course, this direction of rotation is very important to our Nyquist plot. In fact, it, it, almost, it, it almost entirely defines the shape of the Nyquist plot. Okay? So we've got our bottom two rows of our table. Now, if there were no pole at the origin, we can go ahead and sketch the Nyquist plot directly from those two rows because we know that the 0, minus, and 0, plus points and the positive and negative uh, infinity points would map to each other, giving us a closed contour in the s-plane. However, because we have that pole at the origin, there's a couple of things uh, that we have to do in addition to just getting these bottom two rows. From seeing the previous examples, we also know that we need to compute the real part of L of j omega when omega equals 0 plus, because we know that this is going to be a non-zero value, and we need to include this on our Nyquist plot for it to be accurate. What it means is we need to express, of course, L of j omega as real plus imaginary. Okay, so L of j omega, our frequency response function, is what we got up here. We need to conjugate this denominator in order to get uh, a real value denominator, and then the numerator we're just again going to separate into the real and imaginary components. Okay, so what that looks like here is we've got L of j omega is equal to k times 1 plus omega j over omega j times negative 5 plus omega j. Okay, so the conjugation here is to multiply top and bottom by negative omega j, and also multiply top and bottom by minus 5 minus omega j, like so. Now doing this guarantees us a positive denominator, and that denominator looks like this. It's omega squared times omega squared plus 25. And again, I didn't have to show any work because I'm just applying uh, a property of complex numbers. Okay? That's, this is what you get when you multiply complex conjugates together. The numerator, well it's just a matter of distributing in this minus omega j and then f you know expanding these two uh, resulting binomials and you're just going to have to sort of plow through that algebra and separate the real and imaginary components. So the real component is minus 6k times omega squared. And the imaginary component is, is uh, k times omega times omega minus, I'm sorry, times 5 minus omega squared over the same denominator. And this becomes our L of j omega written as real plus imaginary. At this point, you can actually go ahead and clean it up. This omega squared should cancel with this omega squared, which will clean things up just a little bit. So we have minus 6k over omega squared plus 25, and then one of these omegas here will cancel. So you just got k, and then omega 
in the denominator here. Okay, so again, we've got real plus imaginary, uh, and this is L of j omega. Okay, what we need to do again is to evaluate uh, the real part of this uh, when omega is close to zero. So, the real part of L of j omega when omega is equal to zero plus equals I'm just plugging in zero everywhere I see in the real component. So I get minus six k over twenty-five. Okay, so I needed this I needed this piece of information to combine with the information that I get in the first column of this table. And that will give me the first point on the Nyquist plot. Okay, so sketching what we have so far in the S plane for the Nyquist plot looks like this. And remember, this is our B contour. This is where we're going to sketch our Nyquist plot. It's not the same complex plane as where we map our poles and zeros. And so what we have is we're going to be at a phase angle of minus 270. So minus 270, starting from the real axis, is so there's minus 90, minus 180, minus 270. We're somewhere on the positive imaginary axis. We're also at a distance from the origin of infinity. Okay. However, there's also this real component of negative 6k over 25. Okay, so the only way to draw this on a finite sheet of paper is is basically to really exaggerate that point. Okay, so I'm going to draw 0 plus out here. And this is very, very not to scale. Okay, so that's 0 plus. This point here, we're calling that negative 6k over 25. This distance here is infinite, right? That's infinity. And this angle here is meant to approximate negative 270 degrees. It's just that I drew this real offset so not to scale that this angle uh, correspondingly does not appear to be minus 270. Okay, so this is the only way to really express uh, these Nyquist plots on a on a finite sheet of paper. Okay. However, now that we've mapped our first uh, frequency at zero plus, we can go ahead and continue with the mapping as we sweep through all of the angles to get to positive, uh, I'm sorry, all the frequencies to positive infinity. The key here is to recognize that we're sweeping from minus 270 to minus 90 degrees, while at the same time the magnitude, or the, uh, the distance from the origin, is shrinking from infinity to zero. Okay, so we're mapping from what was our approximation for minus 270. We're mapping from this angle through to negative 90. Well, at the same time, the distance from the origin is shrinking to zero. So what this Nyquist plot ends up looking like is something like this. Something like this. Okay. And of course, we need to indicate the direction of increasing omega and also label our key frequencies, zero plus and positive infinity. At this point, we are maybe one-third of the way there because we can get the second portion by mirroring about the real axis. Right, so everything about this should be symmetrical and this is going to give us the mapping from zero minus up to zero, I'm sorry, from minus infinity up to zero minus. So we still need to indicate the direction of increasing frequencies like so. Okay. So we have a Nyquist plot now that is, first of all, it's not a closed contour, and we're also missing a key piece of information, right? In order to use the Nyquist stability criterion, just like in the previous example, we're going to need to know what this point is right there. And we've been calling that point A, so we'll stay with that notation. So we need to know point A, and we also need to know which way zero minus maps to zero plus. Okay, so there's two big components left to do, but it doesn't matter which order we do them in. It really, they're independent computations. Okay, so why don't we knock out that, uh, inter that real axis intersection point first. Um, it's relatively straightforward, I would argue, because we've already done the hard part. Okay, we've already written L of j omega as real plus imaginary. So for these trickier examples,
I encourage you to write this very neatly uh, and, and in a very organized fashion because you'll, you'll be able to use it multiple times. Okay, remember to find the intersection point A. Because the Nyquist plot is in fact a plot of L of j omega, we just have to take the imaginary part and set it equal to zero. And that's going to give us the omega value for which we uh, intersect the real axis. Okay, so we need to set the imaginary part of L of j omega equal to zero. And what we see here is that we have, okay, it's, it's k times 5 minus omega squared divided by omega times omega squared plus 5. We're setting this equal to zero, solving for omega. Omega, well actually all the values of omega are, uh, let's see, we have plus and minus root 5, and also plus and minus infinity. Okay, so there's four points on this Nyquist plot that the uh, that it should intersect the real axis, and that's consistent with what we see here, right? Plus and minus infinity, and then two points here, one from sort of the increasing positive and from the increasing negative. And just coincidentally, uh, compared to the last problem, it, it occurs at the same frequency. So plus root 5 or minus root 5 is the frequency at which we are intersecting the real axis at point A. What we have to do from here is to back substitute root 5 into L of j omega, but remember, let's be uh, intelligent about that, we're only going to back substitute into the real component of L of j omega, because if we plugged in root 5 into the imaginary part, we would get 0 by definition. Okay, so what that looks like is ultimately point A is going to be what we get when we plug in uh, uh, L of j times root 5. So we're just plugging root 5 in for omega into the real portion of L of j omega, and we're going to get minus 6k over root 5 squared plus 25. So this is minus 6k over 30, which boils down to minus k over 5. Okay, so relatively quickly we can now get this intersection point A, which is minus k over 5, and the only reason it was that simple is because we had previously computed L of j omega as real plus imaginary for, for this part of the computation here. Okay, so what that leaves us with now is we just need to find out how 0 minus maps to 0 plus here. And this goes way back to our assumption about that pole at the origin. Okay, we can do this again, we can do this either way. We can assume that the pole at the origin is stable, right? We can assume that this is stable, and if we assume this is stable, then the number of unstable open loop poles is only one. If we assume S equals zero is unstable, then the number of unstable poles at the origin, I'm sorry, then the number of unstable poles in L of S becomes two. And that assumption will change the Nyquist plot but like I said before, it will not change the outcome of the Nyquist stability criterion. Okay, so we can do this either way. For the moment, let's just assume that the pole at the origin is stable. Right, we need to state this very boldly somewhere because this assumption is going to carry us through to through the rest of the problem. So assume S equals zero is stable what we have to do is then to recognize that on our A contour, okay, so our A contour is the one here where we were mapping our poles and zeros, our A contour, what we want to do is zoom in really close to the origin, zoom in really close to the origin so that we can see uh, sort of what needs to happen in order for our assumption to remain consistent with the drawing. Okay, so we'll draw our A contour but we'll zoom in so far that we'll actually just give it a new name. We'll call it the A prime contour. And the A prime contour only consists of the pole at the origin. Okay, so we're so zoomed in that we're only looking at the pole at the origin. And because we're so zoomed in, we can actually see where 0 plus and 0 minus are very clearly because you know we've got that sort of resolution now. Okay, so here's our real axis. Here's our imaginary axis. Now the key here to this whole problem is to recognize that, well, if the pole at the origin is to be stable, 
then it needs to reside in the left half plane, right? This pole here needs to live in the left half plane if it's going to be consistent with our assumption. And one way to uh, to make this pole sort of exist in the left half plane is to simply move the imaginary axis around to the right of it. Okay, so we're just bending the imaginary axis in this little tiny semicircular uh, path, and that is going to make this picture, which now all of this stuff is the left half plane, it will make this picture consistent with our assumption. Okay, so the idea is if you can if you can fathom, if you can wrap your head around this little trick, then the rest of the problem is relatively straightforward because because for the rest of the problem we're following the same steps in this method two uh, procedure that we did in the first half of the problem, except that we're only considering this sort of sub transfer function. So L of L L bar of s is only the pole at the origin. That's all we care about right now, um, right? Because we're so zoomed in, that's all we can see in this small field of view. Uh, if L bar of s equals 1 over s, then we go ahead and carry out the same method 2 computation. We have L bar of j omega. Replace j omega everywhere we see s. Replace every complex number with uh, an exponential counterpart and factor, we have essentially the following, uh, right? We've got L bar of j omega written in exponential form. What that gives us is again a an analytical form for the magnitude and the phase of L bar of this little special secondary transfer function. From here, we need to do our A prime contour, which follows the same steps as the regular A contour, in that we're going to draw rays from the poles to an arbitrary point on the imaginary axis. Remember, now the imaginary axis is sort of this semicircle, semicircular region, and we're going to define the radius and the phase angle as we always do. After we draw a prime contour, we need to make a table, just like last time, just like the first part of the problem, only this time we are not mapping from 0 plus to positive infinity. We're only mapping from 0 minus to 0 plus. And the things that we need to keep track of are epsilon and phi, the phase angle. Okay? Because we bent the imaginary axis to the right in a semicircular fashion around that uh, pole, then epsilon just remains a constant value through that range. Okay, so epsilon is just a tiny value and it stays the same tiny value. The phase angle goes from minus 90 and because of this path which takes us to the right, we start at minus 90 and we increase up to a phase angle of 0 and we continue on to a positive uh, 90 degrees. Okay, that's the key here. If, if we assumed it the other way it would go from minus 90 and continue backwards to negative 270, and that's what changes the entire problem here. And that's it. Those are the only two parameters we have to keep track of. The rest is now we get to employ these two uh, analytical uh, magnitude and phase functions. So the magnitude function is 1 over epsilon. Well, epsilon is just a tiny, tiny value, so we're mapping from infinity to infinity which is actually good that those are those are infinity because remember on the Nyquist plot itself we are trying to map this point which exists an infinite distance from the origin to this point which is an, ex, uh, an infinite distance from the origin. Okay, So the fact that we get infinity inf and infinity here and here that actually agrees very well with our, our Nyquist plot so far. The phase function is the negative of phi as we see up here and so phi is 90 so that becomes 90 and we go to, to 90 here, which becomes negative 90. Now, the, this is the, sort of the key to this whole problem, is to get the direction of rotation here right. So 90, which is up here, we need to subtract degrees to get from this number 90 to negative 90 down here. So this indicates clockwise rotation. That's kind of the key here. Okay, So clockwise rotation, as we map from 0 minus to 0 plus, looks like the following. 
you need to find zero minus on your Nyquist plot. Sometimes zero minus is down here, sometimes it's up here. It just depends on the mapping so far. You need to find zero minus, and then from zero minus, map to zero plus at a distance of infinity in this direction uh, of rotation, so clockwise. So from zero minus to zero plus at a distance of infinity in a clockwise fashion looks like this. And remember that the distance from the origin to any point along this curve is infinite. It's an infinite sort of path that we're taking there. Okay. And this becomes the Nyquist plot. Uh, this becomes a Nyquist plot, but it's associated with the assumption that s equals zero is stable. Right, so you need to put this qualifier on your Nyquist plot that this picture goes with the assumption that the pole at the origin is stable. If we had assumed that the pole at the origin was unstable, well, a lot of things would change. Okay, first of all, if we were to assume it was unstable, so let's say that this is the stable assumption, okay, well, if we were to assume that the pole at the origin was unstable, we would actually end up bending the imaginary axis the other way. Okay, so this would be the unstable assumption. And what that would change is almost nothing on this argument or this analysis except for the phase, right? This is the part that changes when you change the assumption. Whereas before we went from negative 90 up to positive 90, if you assume that the pole at the origin is unstable, the phase phi goes from negative 90 actually to negative 270. Okay, it keeps going, so here's negative 90, it keeps going through negative 180 all the way up to negative 270. Okay, that's the key difference here is that this is the, the change for when it's unstable. And if this is the change for when it's unstable, then as we apply our phase function, we actually go from 90 to positive 270. Okay, and, and the, di the direction of rotation for when it's 90 degrees, which is here, to 270 degrees, which is here, is actually counterclockwise. Okay, so the stable assumption in this case means that we're going to map in a clockwise uh, fashion from 0 minus to 0 plus. The unstable assumption would indicate that we would map in a counterclockwise um, circle from min uh, 0 minus to 0 plus. What that means on the Nyquist plot is if we were to assume that the pole at the origin is unstable, then this sort of infinite circle or semicircle mapping from 0 minus to 0 plus would actually go the other way. Right? So the entire Nyquist plot would change again based on your assumption for the pole at the origin. Okay, so it's very important to state your assumption on the Nyquist plot uh, when you've got poles at the origin. But I did promise that no matter what assumption you make, the outcome of the Nyquist stability criterion will not change. Okay, so let's re Let's sort of reset now. Now that we have a complete Nyquist plot, we can go back to the Nyquist stability criterion, which of course says that z is equal to p minus n. For this picture that we've drawn here, we assume that s equals zero. We assume that the pole at the origin is stable. That means, according to our original transfer function, that the number of unstable open loop poles is only one. Right, so it's from this uh, unstable pole at positive 5. So for this Nyquist plot, we've got that p is equal to 1, and we want z to be equal to 0, and therefore we want n to be equal to 1. In other words, we want this Nyquist plot to encircle the point negative 1 in a counterclockwise fashion one time. Well, if negative 1 if negative 1 is somewhere out in this loop over here, the Nyquist plot is actually encircling negative 1, but is doing so in a clockwise fashion. Right? So when a Nyquist plot encircles negative 1 in a clockwise fashion, we actually consider n to be negative 1, which is strange, right? But if you think about it, this Nyquist plot is encircling negative 1 in a counterclockwise fashion 
negative one times. So it's a very weird way to think about it. Um, but in this picture right here, n would actually be equal to negative one. We want n to be equal to positive one, so we want negative one to fall inside of this inner loop of the Nyquist plot so that we get a counterclockwise encirclement. And we can place negative one inside of this smaller loop as long as k is greater than five. Right? That would push, that would expand the Nyquist plot such that this inner loop here, this smaller loop, contains the value negative one. Okay, so if we want n to equal 1, we want k to be greater than 5, right? Because if k is greater than 5, that implies that n is equal to 1. And if n is equal to 1, that implies that z is equal to 0. So for all values of k that are greater than 5, the conclusion here is that we get 0 unstable poles, and hence we guarantee closed loop stability, okay? This, again, like I said, is, is, a, is a heck of a problem. It contains what I think are all of the subtle nuances uh, that we've covered so far in the course. So if you can wrap your head around this problem and kind of understand it all the way through, I think you're in great shape. What I encourage you to do at this point would maybe, while it's still fresh, just take it the opposite way. Go finish the problem assuming that the pole at the origin is unstable and complete the Nyquist stability criterion using that assumption. What you're going to find is you should get the same criteria for k. In other words, k should be greater than 5. Only the arguments here will be a little bit different. You'll find that instead of 1 minus 1 equals 0, really the only thing that changes is that you get 2 minus 2 is equal to 0. So the outcome, like I said, of the Nyquist stability criterion should not change. Okay. So this is a pretty heavy-duty example. Uh, I encourage you to uh, rest at this point and try and digest some of this material. Uh, maybe pause and go back if, if things didn't quite make sense. And uh, you may need to revisit this more than one time to, to fully understand how it works. Okay? But at this point, I think we are going to conclude our discussion of Nyquist stability criterion. Um, you've got several tools for sketching the Nyquist plot as well as sketching the Bode plot and ultimately how to sketch the Nyquist plots for very um, complicated transfer functions. Okay, so uh, we're going to stop it here and I'll let you sort of uh, revisit this material as needed.